אז hello everybody, my name is... Very polite. Okay, my name is Shai Arel. I'm a computer vision researcher at eBay. Um, previously to that, I was consulting in a company named Corrigan. I was on my way to University of Southern California when eBay decided to purchase this company, and here, here I am. So today, uh, we were talking about generative models in general and variational autoencoder, which is my favorite, personal favorite generative model in particular. Um, <laughs> right. um, so, what we'll say today is what is wrong with discriminative models, right? Um, what is the great thing about variational autoencoders? And I can't compete with that. <laughs> I really can't. <laughs> All right. And how variational autoencoders uh, can be improved using GAN. And I know a lot of people have heard about GAN, and there is a lot of talk, talk about GAN. Um, but I'm, I'm here to make order in the mess, maybe. Um, so let's get started. This is what we're not going to talk about today. We are not going to see the lower bound uh, stuff. So no heavy mathematics, just intuition, right? So Richard Feynman said, what I cannot create, I do not understand. He's some kind of famous physics guy. I don't know exactly who is it, but. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, he's not too far away from the truth because everybody see that a lot of uh, models today can generate like high, really, really realistic images. And some people get really excited about that, and some people just don't know why they should be excited about that. <laughs> so I'm here to uh, show you the way why you should be excited when you see this, right? So here it is. Some of you are familiar with this uh, slide by a raise of a hand, who, is, who knows this, this? No one? No one? Really? No one? OK. This was the best paper award of 2015 by NVIDIA, and basically by everybody else who is using deep learning in, in this time. Um, the title of this, uh, uh, of this paper was Why are, why are uh, deep learning models are easily fooled, or how to fool deep learning models. Right. Um, so they pointing out something very, really trivial. Um, when you when you when you when you are training discriminative models, right? Discriminative models are kind of models when, the, when you present them the input, and you in, and you expect one output. For example, is it a dog or a cat? Okay. So when you presenting a discriminative uh, a model, all you're trying to see, all you're trying to calculate is just a hyperplane. Anything on the left is a dog, everything on the right is a cat. Okay? You don't really understand how dogs and cats look like, but all, you all you're left with is just a hyperplane. Everything on the left is one, anything on the right is second. Right? So this is actually really old relaxation. When people invented uh, logistic regression, they, they actually did this relaxation, and they were really proud of it because we say, they said actually computing the joint probability of x and y together is really hard. So let's try to calculate the conditional probability, and the conditional probability is just let's let's talk about the conditional probability is actually mapping directly to this hyperplane. When you're calculating conditional probability, you say, I don't really understand, I don't really care about the joint probability of x and y together. I don't really want to um, model this cluster, but I will only uh, model this hyperplane that divides between two clusters. Right? So every time you're doing discriminative model, this is what you're doing. You're just calculating a hyperplane. Everything on the left is A, everything on the right is B. You really don't you don't know anything about group A and group B. You just know how to separate them, right? 
So what is wrong with discriminative models in general? Not just deep learning models, discriminative models as they are. Okay? So let's start with an example. Um, this is the example from the same paper. Uh, we all see here a school bus, right? And here the same, the same school bus in our eyes, right? Same here. You, there is kind of a chicken here and some, some kind of a temple here. Same image. In our eyes, it's the same image, left and right. But I can tell you that the right image is the left image plus some noise. This is not random noise, but it, this noise is calculated. And by the end of this lecture, you will know how to calculate this specific noise that makes the picture on the right to the network at least. The network now thinks that this image on the left is a school bus, and the image on the right, can I by guess what it is? Ostrich. <laughs> right. 99.99% ostrich. This is what the network thinks about these images. And this is um, ridiculous, preposterous. Um, no, I, I actually don't know who wrote that, but it's super famous. Just search for uh, deep, deep learning, are easily fooled, best paper of all, of all 2015, and you will, you will see. Um, this is not an uh, open AI and not Ian Goodfellow. Um, and then they did some more uh, tricks to trick the neural networks, and this at least look, makes sense, right? These, these ones does look like a button on a remote con control. And you can see that the network thing that this one is a remote control, right? And this is some kind of a starfish, but it's totally unrecognizable to us. Wow. But this, this like, it's like really weird. The network think that this one, this noise right here is armadillo. 99.99% accuracy. It's confident, like, really confident that this one is armadillo. And the question is why? So I will go a little bit back. And the core reason of why is because we are not modeling the cluster of recognizable image. We are moving away. The only thing you, want, you, you need to do in order to fool discriminative model, any discriminative model, is just move away from the cluster of uh, the real distribution of the images Take it away down below, to the left of the, of, to the hyperplane. This is the hyperplane. It's just, it's just any picture in this area will be complete noise, and we're very confident that, that the network will uh, say that all these guys are armadillo for what? For what? what yeah. So we get the basic idea of what's wrong with this current model. Um, this is not entirely true because people have done some good work with discriminative model, regardless of what I'm saying or what this paper is saying. But the basic idea, it, it gets more acute when you're using deep learning models. Right? The, the, the dimensionality increases dramatically, and it's, it is much easier to fool neural networks. Right? So once we establish that uh, Discriminative models are not the thing you want to do when you're doing uh, deep learning. Um, we will move forward to generative model. And another thing that we see further ahead that employing structure on the latent space in generative model is also a very cool th trick that you can do. Right? The reason why is like when you're doing generative models, people have shown that uh, you can use generative models with semi-supervised learning techniques and get very, very m close to state of the art with like two order of magnitude less labeled data. Okay? For example, in, on MNIST, the hand digit uh, data set, uh, these guys who invented variation a lot encoder can got really close to state of the art with just 10 labeled data points instead of 5,000 5, data points, right? So it's three order of magnitude less labeled data. Um, so let's start for the finish. This is, this is from the paper of uh, variational based uh, autoencoders. This is exactly what we will talk about today. Um, what you see here is like a Gaussian distribution view from the top, right? Um, and this is actually the latent space representation of the digits here. All right. 
So this is this is like beginning from there, and this is what we want. We, what we want actually is to map our entire data points, okay, to a Gaussian distribution, right? Completely Gaussian distribution, and as as I said, this whole process is completely unsupervised. So the the training phase does not see the labeling. The labeling here is like one, zero to, to nine. The and you can see that it got, it got most of them really good, really, really, really good. All the zeros are clustered here together, and all the ones are here down here, or all, all the sevens are down here. You get really good separation of the data points. With almost this this one was generated without any supervision, right? And then if you have this embedding, if you have this uh, translation of image pixels to this space to this two-dimensional Gaussian. You can use any semi-supervised semi -supervised technique, right? Almost any semi-supervised technique, like label propagation or anything you want, and you get really good results, like really good results. OK, so by raise your hand, who knows autoencoders basics? Right, cool, right, great. So we will try to move away from autoencoders to variational autoencoders, which is just like a little, a little thing you put on top, and you get variational autoencoder, and everybody will ha will be happy and go home with something. Okay, so autoencoders, autoencoders in general, built uh, are built from two parts: the encoder network, when you get an input and you try to map it to some uh, latent space domain. Okay, embedding space, feature space. I don't know. I don't care how you, how you call it. And then much, once you have the embedding space right in place, you try to um, reconstruct the same input, right? So far, so good. So what is the difference between autoencoders and variational autoencoders? It's, it's just like this guy here. I'm employing some structure. I'm, I'm constrained the, the latent space to be Gaussian, normal distribution. This is the only, th this is the only difference, right? So, what do I need to uh, represent a Gaussian? I need two, st two things, mean and variance, right? I, mean, I need a mean vector and a variance vector. So I take my cat, right? I encode it to, I w using this uh, encoding ne network, which is just a uh, convolutional network or fully connected network, I don't care what it is, right? And this network will output two vectors, mean vector and standard deviation, right? And then once I have these, these two guys in place, I will just sample from it the actual representation. And this is the variational part, right? And, and then once I have this latent vector or the representation vector, or the feature vector, I, I, the only thing I need to do is reconstruct the same image. For, 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 for example, if, if I didn't do this one, this, this only, this only three blocks right here, if it, if it was just encoding to a, to a latent vector and just reconstructed it, it was just autoencoder. But these three blocks, just the, the cumbersome process of using mean vector and standard deviation and sample for it, transformed this uh, autoencoder to variational autoencoder. Everything's okay so far. So I don't know how time, how much time do we have, so we'll skip the questions. But again, basically, what is the problem here? And the problem is that sampling from a le from distributions, st random sampling, is not a continuous is is not a thing that you can backpropagate through it. Right. This is the only thing. So these guys, uh, these guys are Peter Dory Kinma and. Uh, and Max Wailing, these guys right here. Th actually, the same idea came out from two from two separate places in in uh, roughly the same time, from Google DeepMind and these guys. But actually, Kinma and Max Wailing was was hitting the point right right away, and uh, you know, I like that their paper better. <laughs> um, so the reparameterization repar trick, uh, basically. The original form is like we have uh, mean and standard deviation, and you want to uh, sample for it, 
and this this operation is not uh, differentiable. You can backpropagate through this this thing. So what they did what they did is just you want you want something around the mean vector, all right? This is the mean vector. You have standard deviation. They said just le let's stretch the standard deviation with some random noise with epsilon. Okay, and once you stretch the standard deviation with some uh, with some noise, just add it to the mean vector, and then you get some. This is actually equivalent to uh, to random sampling, right? But this equation is totally linear. I can calculate the gradient with with respect to mu and sigma really easily. It's it's a linear equation. It's nothing nothing weird about that. So they did the random sampling to something that is uh, totally deterministic. Uh, not totally, because you do sample epsilon, but it's, it's almost deterministic, and you can backpropagate it like really easy. So this is the whole reparameterization trick in two sentences. So recap number one, what we saw so far. Is auto we saw autoencoder with Gaussian latent space. This is the only thing we saw till for so far. And how to sample from latent space g distribution the right way. Right? This. Next, we will add some constraint on the latent space. Actually, we, we will try to move the Gaussian in latent space to normal distribution, zero mean unit variance. And then we will say a couple of things about why it's so cool to have unit variance, no uh, unit variance in, in your feature space, right. and then lastly, but only lastly, we will talk about GAN. Just two slides about GAN. Okay, some background before K divergence. Um, basically, K divergence is weighted sum on some similarity measures measurement. Okay, some people, some some crazy people, actually tends tend to modify the similarity measure, but we don't care about that. All I want you to have in mind when you see k divergence is like pushing one distribution p to q, OK? It has an equation. If you want the details, you can look for it. But once what I want you to have in mind when I say k divergence is, is pushing p towards q, OK? We have, we have two distribution, p, which is the actual distribution of the representation of the images in the latent space. And we want to push it towards <coughs> normal distribution, zero mean unit variance. By changing x? Not by changing x, by changing the repres rep representation of x. <laughs> OK, the encoding network just transform x to some latent represent representation. And I want that the latent res representation will be a normal distribution. OK, this is, the con this is the other constraint. So now, this is, this is actually the full variational autoencoders from bottom to top. We start here at the bottom, right? This is, like, this is all you have to know to build your own variational autoencoder. You start with your input, x. You pass it through the encoding network, which is just a convolutional neural network with two output, two vector output for each image. One of them is the mu, the mean, and the other one is a standard deviation. Then we have the reparameterization trick. We sample randomly epsilon, and we skew sigma with this epsilon and add mu to it, and then we have z, the actual representation of the image. Okay, stochastic representation of the image, right? And then we try to decode it. We get x tilde or x tag. And we want that x and x tag will be as close as possible to each other. The other thing that we are doing is we're saying that we want mu and sigma to be as close as possible in KL divergence sense, right, to normal distribution, zero mean unit variance, right? So this is how you it get done from head to toes. Any question? No. Excellent. So it will be 30 minutes. <laughs> um, again, what is the problem here? And this is like the last part we have, we are going a little deep to gun. Here is the hint. No one? And now, L2 distance in pixel space. Okay. 
if we if we if we actually knew how to build similarity function between two images, I would I would not be standing here right now. We will all be out of job. So L2 distance in pixel space is like it doesn't it's nothing. It most of the time it's nothing, right? So if we actually knew how to build good similarity measurement between images, okay. So we will, I wouldn't be standing here. So this is just an example of what I'm trying to say. This is the, this is an original image, right? In this in this image, I was I was just taking just a little bit of a volume from each uh, pixel, and I got 50 50 k pixel wise differ differential between the original image and this image. And this one, I just blacked out one square, and I got only 10k difference in the pixel space. So L2 distance said that these two are more si uh, that these two are more similar. This one in the right with the black square is more similar to the original image, which which is uh, obviously false, right? So here we go to GAN, as I promised. Just two slides about GAN. Okay, this is from Summit Chintala blog. Basically, what you do is take a generative uh, model and a discriminative model and, ma and, make and make them fight. Actually, let's talk about it just a little bit. We, we with variational autoencoder, we, we already have generative model, right? We, d we generate images, and now we have another another. Uh, discriminative model, which try to distinguish between generated images and real images. One of them are labeled 1, and the other are labeled 0. And we all know that deep models are doing fairly decent job in discriminating stuff, images in particular. Right? So what happens if the discriminative network is doing poorly, is doing sh like shit job? Right? Um, it's it might be one of the two. One case, this model is, is not good enough. It's not strong enough. But it's it's a deep learning model. It's supposed to be it's supposed to handle everything, right? So it might it must be the case that this task is very, very hard. And if the task is very, very hard, this means that your generated images are almost indistinguishable from the real images. And this is what this loss function actually does. It, GAN actually comes to replace this poor, this unrealistic loss function, right? This, this, this is what GAN does. The discriminative net network come to, comes to replace this shitty, really shitty <laughs> um, loss function. So it replaced your loss function. So if you don't know how to construct loss function, you should look into GAN as a last result. But if you do know how co to construct your loss function very good, don't use GAN, right? This is my main, this is, it's not a, a takeaway in the end, but it's takeaway for, no for now, because they get a lot of, I don't know, uh, uh, co people come to an interview with at eBay and with, we say, what, the coolest, what is the cool thing you, you've been working with, with lately? And everybody says GAN. So I tell them, what, what do you use GAN for? And like very little, very few actually know that GAN is here to replace your loss function. They can construct GAN, they can code it, they can show you everything from the generative model and the discriminative model. And if I will, will let them code, they will code it like perfectly. But they, they're not, they don't fully understand that the only thing that the GAN does is just replace your loss function. So here is the variational autoencoder together with GAN. So you have the input. You encode it to the latent space Z with the variational trick, as we talked before. You decode it and get X tilde. And then you have X and X tilde, two rivals. And you put them to the discriminative network and, try and ask the discriminative network to label X tilde as 1 and X as 0. Actually, this distinguish between, between the two. So this one, this part is the variation autoencoder part, and this one 
is the GAN part. You see there is overlapping, right? So just one, one, one last question. And I promise this is the end. Why do we, why do we love normal distribution, zero mean unit variance? What, what the unit variance stand for? Well, it actually stands for that it implies in the pan exactly. I like you. <laughs> uh, it implies that your features are independent. This is this is like straightforward. If you have unit variance of your features, this means that every two features that are that every two features are unco not correlated. This is what it means because. When you do dot product between, between two, 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 two uh, sampling from two different features, you get zero, which mean, this means they are, they, are, they are not correlated. So we actually represent your image to an uncorrelated feature space, meaning that each feature captures one specific and unique attribute of the feature, of the image. And this is, like, this is the most amazing thing that you uh, will ever see. Right? And this is, this is what this slide talks about. You see these sad faces, right? And these happy faces, all they did here is just like moving a single feature from the feature space. One, one feature, let's say you have a feature space in a length of 100. You just move one feature and they reconstruct the image and from input of sad faces, they get output of happy faces. I mean, this is, this is very impressive. I was blown away by that. For each change in each feature, you receive the meaningful changes in the Exactly. Way. For each feature, you get unique and meaningful, most of the time meaningful. Some of the time, it will be not meaningful. But you have to play with each feature and see what it caught. Some of them will, caught, will catch garbage, like lighting and I don't know, some weird stuff, but some of them will be very interesting, right? So this one is like, wow. And actually, this is, I, I'm pretty sure some of you saw this slide before. This is from uh, Disagan, so myth Chintila again. And actually, when, what you can do with this hyperspace, with, with this embedded space, is actually do some arithmetics. You can take smiling women, minus natural women representation in the latent space and add some natural men representation in the latent space, in the Gaussian space, minus plus and get smiling men. Which is amazing, I don't know. In my eyes, this is smiling men. Smiling women minus natural women plus men equals smiling men. Same as Wotovec. And if we will go away uh, home and try to get in this page, this is like Peter Durek Kingman, the author of uh, one of the two authors of variational autoencoders. And you will uh, click on this uh, demo page. You will see how Amnist embeds into 12, uh, f uh, f 12, len tw 12 feature length of 12 feature vector. And you can play with each feature vector just a little bit and see what it captured. Some of them capturing the, the stroke width, boldness. Some of them, the, the, the s how, do you, uh, paint, how do you paint the actual letter? Is it skewed to the left or skewed to the right? How tall it is? Each, of each feature captures something distinct and unique in the character characteristic of the painting of the image. Right? Ah, as, and as I promised, Actually, how much time do you have? What? How much time do you have? Five minutes. All right, this is perfect. I will skip this one and go to Igan explained in five minutes. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm sure some of you actually know this, this paper. All right, this is a really recent paper from Berkeley University. And what they did is just um, add some constraint on the latent space, but, but actually it's a very cool paper and we we'll see how, how it works in like five minutes because we know all the theory, theory right now. Um, so, how IGAN works in five minutes? 
you just take an image, you project it to the latent space, okay? And once you project this specific image to the, lat to the latent space, you are solving two constraints uh, equation. One of them saying, you know what? I want a different image. I want a new image which is close enough to the embedding point. I want to see if this point just got embedded to this section, I want to stay near this section, right? The other thing is just, I want that the output image will have these feature characteristics, okay? So the thing that you do is you just do gradient descent from the pixels. You, ha you have pixel constraints and you have latent space constraints. You have two constraints, this is it. The pixel constraints says, I want these lines to be green, I want this area to be green, and uh, I want the mountain over here, and snow, and blue sky, and everything. This, one, this part you can do by gradient descent of, of the image. You, you get some generated image, and then you say, you know what, I want that the generated image will have thi this characteristic. And you, uh, and you get some error function. And you get some error gradients propagated back to the latent space. And this, this just, and the error gradients just let you move around in this space a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right. But, but and when you move in this latent space, you will actually get these pixel um, constraints satisfied. But additionally, you don't want to move too far away from the original image, and this is what you get. This is Eigen explained in five minutes, right? Like, really cool paper. Not a lot of new stuff from this paper specifically, but they piggyback on a lot of uh, previous work, and, and it's excellent. And the other thing that I promised Uri is that there will be some code examples. All right, so we will. I'm getting there right now. Don't worry. <laughs> um, as I promised, um, we want to fool the neural networks, and we can do that like with three lines of code. When we, try, w when we are training neural network, we are actually optimizing theta. Let's say that f is our neural net network. And when we are training neural network, we are trying to find the best parameter theta that can satisfy that f of x parameterized by theta, x equals y. This is what we do. We optimize theta. And let's say we have a pre-trained network. We know the weights are good and everything is good. We won't, don't want to touch the network. Now we want to actually modify x, okay? We want to modify x. We fix y to be ostrich. So let's say that x is a, is a school bus, right? And now we say that, you know what? I don't want that this picture specifically will be a school bus. I want, to, I want it to be an ostrich, right? So you get a um, one hot representation of the, of the ostrich. You feed forward the X through the network, and the network says, okay, it's a school bus. I know, I know this guy, this is a school bus, right? So you get error gradients, right? And you, and you propagate back all the way to the image, right? You optimize X with this loss function. And in codes, it's like three lines of code. People, does people, everybody can see this? Um, can you turn off the light? We? Miles one. Okay, so um, <coughs> so this is the network. This is like getting the actual prediction of the network. This is me telling the network, you know what? Uh, regardless of your prediction, I want that this picture will be ostrich. This is the label, right? And then this is the cool part. I want the gradient with respect to the inputs. This is the the only different. Basically, what you get here, you calculate when you train in a network, you, you type in, uh, you're getting the gradient with, with respect to the parameters. So now I want the gradient with respect to the inputs, you get the x, and then you're just doing gradient descent for a couple of time and you get 99.99 .99 accuracy. All right, so uh, takeaways. Employing structure on your, on your presentation space is like super cool, super important. We saw the reparameterization trick. So basically, when you, when you are uh, using Gaussian latent space representation, 
in some sense, you're adding volume to your, to your uh, data points. Each data point, instead of being uh, mapped to a single dis distinct point, you're adding volume to it because it's now, instead of being one point, it's a sphere. It's a Gaussian, right? Um, GAN, GAN actually is super cool, but it's only come to replace your loss function. So if you know how to build your own loss function, don't use GAN. If you don't know how to build your loss function, try harder. And if you have a find it, use GAN, <laughs> okay? Because GAN are tricky to, to train. Everybody know that. And the personal takeaways is just, it doesn't work for the first time. Nothing does, okay? So try and try until it works. And another thing is like, I took some slide from this cool young guy. He's 16 years old from Palo Alto. His name is Kevin Franz. He has like amazing blog with all the coolest, latest papers explained in one or two pages. And he's 16. He's fucking amazing, right? So I encourage every, each and every one of you, just go to his blog. It's kvfranz.com uh, and check, check him out. He's like amazing. And you will have access to these slides. And here's a pretty comprehensive uh, reference list. Right? And that's, that's it. Actually, actually, I'm done. We are hiring. eBay is hiring like crazy right now. <laughs> Everything from full stack developers and back end researchers, junior researchers, everything you want, eBay has a place for you. So just contact me, send me an email, and I will forward it to the right uh, people. And this is it. Thank you. <laughs>